The Easter Rising of 1916 was a defining moment in Irish history, a week in which a few thousand visionaries took up arms in Dublin against imperial rule and declared an independent republic of equals. We are again basically right in the heart of what the battlefield would have been a hundred years ago. That tall office building over behind me, that's of course the modern Liberty Hall. But a hundred years ago that was the home of the Irish Trades and General Workers Union, the Irish Women's Workers Union and the Irish Citizen Army. Brutally suppressed by the British and followed by a deadly civil war, the 1916 Rising led to national independence for the South and the division of the country with the more industrial North remaining under British rule. Sinn Féin, founded in 1905, has been dedicated ever since to the creation of a united Irish Republic. And it was 100 years ago, on Easter Monday 1916, in the centre of Dublin, when a small band of revolutionaries proclaimed an independent Irish Republic. This group of poorly equipped Irish men and women took on the might of the largest empire the world had ever seen. It was an empire built on conquest, exploitation, brute force and repression. Following six days of heroic resistance, the centre of Dublin lay in ruins. The leaders met for the last time in 16 Moore Street and ordered a surrender. They were court-martialed by the British. Fourteen were executed in the Stonebreaker's Yard in Camelham Prison. Thomas Kyunt was executed in Cork and Roger Casement was hanged in London. What's historically significant about 1916 is it was one of those turning points in our national history. Uh, it was genuinely the birth of modern Ireland as we understand it today. You know, there's two periods of uh, the end that stood out, one was 1798, uh, which was the birth of the United Irish Movement, and uh, the second was 1916, and uh, the, the, the Easter uh, Rising. And uh, the two people, uh, the, the likes of myself, it was unbelievable. You know, I associate the ideals of 1916 and, and what was being fought for, a break from imperialism, um, as important because it was a break from imperialism and there was a whole set of values that underpinned the idea um, of, of the kind of society that, that, that James Connolly and, and, and his comrades were fighting for. I think there's huge parallels. If you consider that, say, James Connolly, for example, talked about the issues that sort of were in the background in Dublin at that time, he very much rallied around what he called the rack-renting, slum-owning landlords. And here we have a huge problem in that way now with landlordism, particularly the big um, vulture funds, many of them from the United States, who've bought up huge blocks of Ireland and rental property and are operating effectively as a cartel, which is driving people out of their homes. 100 years after the rising of 1916, the question of sovereignty is very much on people's minds today. Not only because of the division of the island, but also because of what the Irish have experienced at the hands of global capital. Ireland became, in a way, the poster child of neoliberal globalization. You know, it was the model to be followed because it apparently was this miracle. I mean, you know, it showed that actually neoliberal globalization could work and could work for small countries. It wasn't just about the big, huge um, powers. And, and, and uh, here was Little Ireland, which had been a basket case economy. And suddenly it was, by some uh, calculations, you know, becoming one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, and Ireland was being used, I mean, I don't know if you remember even in the American presidential elections, I mean, John McCain was, was, was citing Ireland as the example for the United States to follow. And what, was, what did they mean by Ireland? What they meant was that Ireland showed that if you cut taxes and you deregulated everything, then the economy would naturally become this fantastically um, rapidly growing one uh, which had wealth for everybody and could then solve all of its all, all of the historical problems of Ireland would be over. Fintan O'Toole wrote a book on Ireland's financial crash called Ship of Fools How Stupidity and Corruption Sank the Celtic Tiger. I think 2016 has been really very interesting because you know, you could look at it and say, oh, it's all just nostalgia for the past. And so, yeah, of course, there's some nostalgia. And of course, there's also some sense that people are desperately trying to get back to some idea of Irish sovereignty. I mean, a very simple thing. You know, what was the Irish Revolution about? It was about just asserting Irish sovereignty. And that sovereignty was completely lost in, in, in 2010. 
the, the international institutions came in and took charge of Ireland. You know, they really did. We're actually going back in time now from a period when maybe in the 60s and 70s, people growing up then had a reasonable expectation for a right to a permanent job. Uh, they could access accommodation and so on. Uh, now, a permanent job is becoming a thing of the past. The jobs that are being created are incredibly casual uh, in their nature, zero hour contracts, people being on the end of the phone, waiting for a phone call, I want you today, no, you can do two hours tomorrow, come back. That's the type of employment. Since the, the, the collapse of both the property boom and the financial sector, um, we've had, uh, Irish society has been ravaged um, by choices that were made by a political elite, influenced obviously by the interests of the banking and financial elite, and those choices that were made by them were to impose the cost of risks that were taken um, by bankers and developers and, and uh, corrupt politicians and to impose those costs on the people of Ireland and the people of Ireland to say that they have suffered greatly is an absolute understatement. Teachers have taken to uh, having to bring in extra lunches themselves in order to feed the children because these schools wouldn't be given any deprived status that has stopped over the last number of years so they're not getting any recognition or assistance in that regard. We've had the reopening of soup kitchens, obviously something which Countess Markovic in her day had rolled up her sleeves and operated in this city and here we are, uh, they've returned and there are literally hundreds of people queuing up at night to get a hot meal from those facilities. So it, they would generally, it wouldn't be just the people who are homeless and behind many a respectable front door where it looks good on the outside in a nice estate with a car, there's people who are really struggling uh, and finding it very, very difficult to manage. I have three kids. Um, we have Molly, who's eight, Noah, who's five, and Daryl, who's two. And they're mad, crazy little bunch of dudes. But I love them to bits. I, I'm actually in a B&B at the minute because obviously I had to present myself homeless, but because of all the stress, um, the, I had another baby drawing that, so that was two babies. And because of all the stress, Dad, I got up and left me, so I was on my own with two kids facing yeah. homeless. Ashlyn and Rachel work with an anti-eviction group called the Irish Housing Network. Matthew's only young, so he doesn't really know because he's nearly three, but currently she's five, she knows. But she knows that she's homeless, but she knows that she will get a house, so yeah. Her behaviour's changed. Yeah. She used to be good. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is for myself and Rachel, there is no recovery. Um, at the moment, it's like there's no way out for us. I mean, the bankers and the rich, and they're having a grand old time with their recovery, but the normal people aren't. We haven't felt a recovery and we can't actually see a recovery. When I had Molly, I was in an apartment, and then because the family was getting bigger, we moved to a bigger house. So, yeah, we've always had a nice home. I got through rent allowance, which uh, the, the government, the government helped me pay, and then I'd make up the rest every month myself. And when we went looking for other houses, we just we were shocked at the prices because when we moved into the house. A house forced, like the rents were only like a thousand pound a month, and then we were like, Whoa, 1600, 1500, 1600 a month, and we knew there was no way we'd be able to afford it. I was told actually two weeks before Christmas 2014 by the landlord he was selling, and then five months later the house got sold. So, in five months, and we couldn't for the life was fine anyway. I told the kids we were going on an adventure. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the adventure, we'd have our own, our own house where we didn't have to give the landlord any more money. So that's what I told them. The activist response over the years has been phenomenal. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's been it's been slow, but it has been phenomenal, and it has culminated, I think, in the the, the absolutely amazing resistance that we have seen to the introduction of the water charges. Personally speaking, 
I have never been on a shit water charges protest. Mm -hmm. Ever. Yeah? The media might portray it as that, but I can guarantee you that the people who matter, the decision makers, the, the mainstream parties, the candidates in the general elections, they knew that there was a major protest on the streets in Dublin City uh, days before the election. But the people who needed to hear it, they could be absolutely sure that they were rattling in their boots. Hundreds of thousands of people engaged in protest action, which touched on way more than water. It was really about the way in which our society was being organised, the fact that the last government had no democratic mandate to bring in charges, and yet it did. And people kind of got off their knees and liked it when they did. I mean, Jim Larkin's catchphrase was always the great appear great only because we are on our knees. Let us rise. And people in Ireland did rise against austerity over the past number of years. And when they were off the knees, they kind of thought, well, you know, we kind of like this, actually. We do a bit more. We are the residents of Terrorist and Action Group. We are here to tell the government to save us from the vulture front. They are about to chase us out of our homes. Most of us have lived in the house for eight and a half years. We are a big community with much culture. Most of us got an eviction letter to leave the houses by the end of this year. And the Dublin West have a large number of the homeless crisis. So the government needs to come to our rescue and put up an affordable scheme so those that are on housing allowance can be able to rent, those that are private renting can be able to buy in future. Huge mobilisation on the streets, huge pressure put on the government, huge level of cooperation between community sector, trade unions and political parties. But what they then did, which was really important, was they launched this Right to Change movement, which is made up of three pillars. The party political pillar, everybody who signed up to a common set of policy principles, the trade union pillar, the same, and then what they called the community pillar, which was all those non-party political, non-affiliated community-based organisations in the 26 counties. There's been a lot of good conferences, there's been a lot of good dialogue, uh, a lot of good mobilisations. And while again that's at quite an embryonic stage, it is certainly the most advanced moment of kind of cooperation between the different spheres of kind of the broad Irish progressive space than we've seen in a long time. The recent general election was one of the more interesting in our history. I think we saw the continued fall in the support for the right-wing parties which dominated Irish politics for decades. To desecrate this site with a shopping centre, what Philistines the political establishment are in this country. The truth is, they want to bury the revolutionary history yeah. of 1916. Historically, they've had 80, 90 percent of the Irish vote that's been falling. It was about 80 percent, uh, maybe 10 years ago. Now it's gone uh, to below 50 or in and around the 50 mark, which is absolutely huge. Now, I suppose what isn't as clear is where has that vote gone? And I suppose there's no clear home that can hoover it all up. The five West Belfast candidates are Francis McCann, a.k.a. Frab, no oh. to you all, uh, Patrick Sheehan, Rosie McCorley, Alex Maskey and Jennifer McCann. After years of partition and armed combat culminating in the occupation of Northern Ireland by British troops, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 established a regional government for the North. Men and women who were once imprisoned or on the run are now running for office including these members of Sinn Féin. She's my granddaughter. The love of my life. Fra McCann was one of many young men interned without charge after the arrival of British troops in the 1970s. In 1976, when he was still in his teens, he was arrested and charged with membership in the Nationalist Irish Republican Army. I spent most of my time uh, on what became known as the Blanket Protest, uh, which was uh, the British government had introduced uh, had ended political status uh, from March 1976 and their attempt to criminalise uh, Republican prisoners. A friend of mine, Kieran Nugent, uh, was sentenced and refused to wear the prison uniform. And the name Blanket came about purely because he was naked in a cell and uh, the prison uh, warder at the time had threw a blanket into the cell and said, if you're not wearing a uniform, uh, that's the only thing that, that you'll get. So thus the blanket protest, the name for the blanket protest was born. It was a very brutal protest uh, during which uh, very, very, very difficult uh, strip searching was done, internal searches, uh, table searches, mirror searches, which meant you were bent naked over a, a table uh, or over a mirror and your back passage, your back side was pulled open and they proved that there. And uh, if you refused to obey them, which we, uh, which we did, 
uh, you were badly beaten. Emma Groves was born in 1976, the same year McCann was arrested. She grew up in an activist Republican nationalist family in the Anderson Town area of Belfast during the height of the so-called Troubles. To me, it just seemed normal that that was normal life. So, so growing up, it was quite hard. You were restricted um, to where you could go in certain areas. You were restricted even in the city centre. You would have to be careful of making friends with people from a different religion. You know, it, it was all... I think I spent my childhood and only looking back on it now, nearly on eggshells. You know, you needed to be careful getting into certain areas. You needed to be careful that if there was a rap broke out, if you were at the shop, have you somewhere? Do you know where to run to? Do you know how to hide? Do you know, you know, those sort of things just to try and make yourself safe for a simple thing of going to the shop? I had seven children and <laughs> I have to say, pre having the kids and getting married, growing up in Belfast was amazing. And that, that's, I think I found that quite hurt, hurtful for these, this, my own kids. If you were picking up out of school, you know, making sure that they stayed together, that you didn't leave yourself open to an army SARS and suddenly roaring up the footpath. That might sound silly, but making them walk in single fell close to the pram or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, never allowing them to stray very far from you. If you had to go into town organising babysitters, you just did not take them into the centre of the city. You could get yourself home, but you couldn't get seven children home. Her fears to speak of Easter week, that week of faith renown. When the boys and girls went out to fight the forces of the crown. With Mausers bold and hearts of gold, the red countess dressed in green. And high above the GPO, the rebel flag was seen. The financial crash of 2008 hit the north of Ireland too and the region was subject to a decade of cuts by conservative governments in Westminster. The centenary of the rising is giving nationalists north and south of the border a chance to talk about poverty, partition, and the meaning of independence today. It wasn't our fault that air won't got back to England short. Take cover! Here in West Belfast and right across the six counties, what, what it became very, very clear is that the Tories, the partition of Ireland, the, the British presence in Ireland and austerity go hand in hand. One of the things that Republicans do, they, we're all part of the community. Uh, we all live in, a, most people that in the place we live are community, working for your community, trying to make better lives for people, trying to create conditions is what a Republican's about. And that's what a pushing for United Ireland's all about. It's not about the status quo, it's about change in the system. Emma Groves is now a member of the Belfast City Council. Her mother works in a Sinn Féin advice centre named Connolly House. The house is called after James Connolly, who was a, a socialist. He was one of the first people who gave women their place in society. He came to Belfast and stood in, in elections, and he was the first one to, the first male to look at the conditions of women working in the mills. And, you know, some of the older women would have told you amazing stories of having met him. And it, it was, you know, a lot of stuff that, that he'd done was small stuff. He, he unionised the women, but also it used to be the people who were breastfeeding their babies because in those days they couldn't afford, 20s and the, 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 in the early part of the century, they wouldn't have been able to afford formula or sometimes milk, sometimes not even proper feeding bottles. He was the first one ever to have a room set aside at the gates of the mill where they could feed their children in a room instead of standing outside in the rain. So I think he's just a total hero. I have no doubt that we will see a republic. I have no doubt that we will see United Ireland. I would like to see it in my lifetime. Um, it's inevitable, but it, it, isn't, it hasn't happened. There's still a lot of hard work to be done. There's still a lot of things that need um, sorted first. You know, the, the quality stuff, um, dealing with the past. I mean, for everybody, for everybody living on this island, you know, that has affected them, you know, so, so there's a lot of stuff that needs dealt with first. Um, but the past is the past, that does need to be dealt with, but we do need to leave it there. We do need to leave it in the past as well. We have to keep moving forward. We can't keep going back, you know, and that's why, you know, while I am a counsellor and everything that I do, you know, that's, that's my ultimate goal still, to keep it moving forward. The group of people 
take on the might of the British Empire. From every generation since, Republicans, activists, communists, nationalists, feminists, artists, anybody with a nest at the end of it, can certainly identify with Conley as one of the great leaders. Politics must now be returned to the safe and warm embrace of the people. So we can no longer have golden circle bankers, developers planning our towns and communities, young people leaving the country of their birth to earn a living elsewhere. They must be invited home to build a new republic. Who's speaks? Our Who's history? Our history. Who's rising? Our rising. Who's heresy? Our heresy. I think the experience of the crash has created a real hunger in Irish people for a sustainable prosperity. I think people are beginning to think, you know, you, global neoliberalism with its, with its promises of, of, you know, a sort of hyper-inflating, this sort of massive bubble and then crash, is that all it has to offer or is there another way of, 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 of being a small country in the contemporary world where, you, of course, you have to be open, you have to be connected, you have to be trading, but you need a sustainable, stable society which is a civilised place, which is a place that actually has some kind of collective dignity. And I think the word republic still means something. You know, people might not be exactly certain what it does mean, but they know that it stands for a certain way of behaving towards each other. It, uh, and at the centre of it is the idea of equality. You know? And there's still a huge hunger among Irish people, and I think among people everywhere, you know, for, for the possibility of living in a society where, you know, uh, as the Irish political philosopher Philip Pettit put it, we can look one another in the eye without fear or deference. You know? we, can, we can treat each other as, as equal citizens. Owen O'Brien, part of a new generation of Sinn Féin politicians, was elected this year to the Irish Parliament. Representing Dublin Midwest, it's the first time his district has ever elected anyone from his party. In the south we went from 9% to 23%. We doubled the size of our Oireachtas team. Uh, we've taken seats, including in this constituency where I am, which we've never had seats in before. So uh, it's about, I suppose, the steady uh, advance of that left Republican, progressive Republican project. Uh, and of course, with greater political strength means you can achieve more. Can we achieve everything we want overnight? No, we can't. Well, as a socialist, we're internationalists, and so borders are not important to us. What's important to us is that all of the working classes of the world um, unite and continue to organise in their communities, to educate, to mobilise around the issues that affect them, and for all of us to move forward together towards a better, fairer and ultimately a socialist society. I think these are positive times. Nothing moves in a straight line, um, but it's moving in the right direction. I think people realise that the days of um, bending the knee to the parish priest, to the politician, to the doctor, to the teacher, those days are over. People have more confidence in themselves, in their own ability which is a little bit ironic in that given some of the fundamentals of life are less secure now than they were even 20 years ago. We have huge levels of uh, social and economic exclusion. We have large sections of our society who don't feel they have the right uh, or the opportunity to participate in shaping the political, social, economic decisions uh, that govern their lives. So if you compare the Ireland of the 21st century with the ideals that were enshrined in that proclamation, there's a huge gap. Uh, and therefore I think we need to be inspired by what the men and women of 1916 uh, did and say we have a huge job uh, of unfinished uh, business to carry on. And it's not that you just you know, narrowly apply the proclamation to 21st century Ireland, of course. It's a different social and economic context, different global and European context. Uh, there are all sorts of new ways of tackling some of the persistent problems such as poverty and homelessness and uh, unemployment. But the core principles are still valid today. And I think really, if this centenary is to mean anything, it cannot just be about remembering the past and commemorating those uh, who sacrificed so much. It has to be about rekindling the public excitement about those ideas so that more people, doesn't matter who they are or, or how they feel it's appropriate for them to do so, but think that it is possible to change the world we live in today. What was so remarkable about that whole revolutionary generation from the 1890s to the 1920s was that re they really believed they could change the world around them.